So today I'm going to talk about a topic not that widely discussed in the drumming or music community that I have certainly found and that I certainly wanted more information on when I was trying to do it. And certainly a question that has been asked of me so many times over the last five years of working on cruise ships and that is reading or more to the point enhancing the levels you have or learning to read really well, how much reading is involved with these jobs etc. That is what I'm going to cover in this vlog today. So this vlog has been two years in the making, but I guess the foundation of it started probably five years ago when I first started to work on ships and start to read to a much, much higher level, higher standard, higher volume, all those things. Some of what I say today is going to sound repetitive, but it literally is just to hammer home some of the points and some of the more crucial points that I have about reading. So I was really lucky to have a foundation in reading from when I first started picking up drumsticks 17 years ago. I learned in school, we learned to read immediately, then I went to private lessons, we enhanced my reading again. And then, so reading has always been like kind of a staple in my life, but it was, I would say only in the last five years of working in the jobs that I've been lucky enough to get and worked hard enough to get is where I've seen the most substantial growth in my reading. And I also understand that not everyone has had the foundation that I had with reading from a much earlier stage of my music career or my music development, learning the instrument and learning to read side by side. I understand not everyone had that. And so hopefully that's why this vlog is gonna help you. And this is definitely not me claiming to be the world's best chart reader, someone who could read anything and everything at any one time. I'm definitely not claiming to be Peter Erskine who can read fly shit on staff paper. These are just very helpful tips that I've picked up along the way of my own reading journey and these are the ones that I'm going to be giving to you. So this is also advice to any musician, this is not exclusive to drums. I will be referencing drums more and showing drum charts because that is the world that I'm in. But the advice is just as sound throughout any musical instrument. So why should you want to get good at reading? There is a fuck ton of reasons why and I will read a few out of the many, many, many reasons why you should be wanting to read. So first things first, it aids in massive musical understanding and comprehension of the notes, why they're important and how to use them. It allows you to make very deep connections between different players, different genres, musical styles, and it allows you to dive very deep into certain playing styles and player styles. It allows you to identify patterns within playing that you can recall, reuse and make your own, unlike what you'll be able to do if you learn from a YouTube video, say which in itself allows you to create your own sound. It allows you to learn at a much quicker rate than relying on learning everything by heart. It allows you to read as many books as your heart desires. You can read unlimited amounts of material. And there's an old phrase in magic that my friend taught me on the last contract I was on. And that says, if you want a new trick, read an old book. And this cannot be more true of music in itself. The amount of drum books that I've read that were made 20, 30 years ago that people now are using without realizing it is absolutely mind-blowing. It gives you a very true foundation of anything that you come across. You can understand what subdivision is, why it's important, where it comes from, all of those different things. It gives you mass confidence to go into any playing situation with short notice if you know that they have charts ready and you can read to a good level. It aids you in being able to write well, which in turn makes you read better. Writing and reading go side by side. That's something I'll cover a bit later on. But it allows you to get a firmer foundation in writing music as well. It allows you to have an endless supply of material to draw upon, not just having to go to the same videos every time to learn your new licks. You can learn the foundation of where they originated, why they're important, where they came from, and how to use them, reuse them, turn them upside down, and make them your own. Last but not least, and arguably the most important point, is that it allows you to get a multitude of different working opportunities. Granted, not every gig is a reading gig, but more than not, I would say, are reading gigs. And why would you purposely not want to aid yourself? Why would you purposely shoot yourself in the foot and put yourself at a disadvantage in an already competitive scene by cancelling out reading? It allows you, like the amount of gigs now that require you to read is mad. So cruise ships, 100%, theatres, orchestras, uh, pantomimes, function gigs, wedding gigs, pop gigs, all these things now require a very decent level of reading. So why would you not want to read? Because these will be opportunities that will shape your development and hopefully give you a very lengthy long career in music. 
Like I just previously mentioned, you can learn a cool flashy new lick from a YouTube video or from your favorite drummers, but wouldn't you rather learn to read to a very good standard, you can go back, read what these elite players are doing, or read books where the, they, these elite players constructed those ideas in the first place, and be able to reconstruct them yourself to create your own sound. To me, that is the ultimate musical discovery of your development, and all of this comes from the ability to read. So if you never wanna learn another lick from another YouTube video and see those stupid, taglines of like, you know, blazing chop in five minutes or any of that stupid shit. All of it comes from being able to read and I'll show you the exact documents where they actually come from later on. So recently I read a book called Effortless Mastery. For anyone who is interested, you should definitely read it. It is all about music and, you know, learning how to rethink within your instrument. And one of the quotes from that book really stuck with me and it was called Unfamiliar, Not Difficult. I think it was a whole chapter. Basically what they were saying was, you need to rephrase anything in your mind that is new to you as unfamiliar, not difficult. So the minute you brand it as difficult, you've kind of lost the battle already. Whereas if you go into it just thinking, this is just unfamiliar to me right now. And you can also draw upon your past experiences. There's probably been things that have, that felt massively unfamiliar at first, and now you can do it with your eyes closed. And so that phrase has stuck with me. So try and think about that as you go through reading because it can be a very, very frustrating process. That just really helped me when I was struggling with my reading earlier on. And I was trying, I was thinking there's everything was, oh God, that chart is just so difficult, difficult to read, difficult to play. And then the minute I started rephrasing it as, oh, it's just unfamiliar. I will get there at some point if I persevere with this. Uh, it kind of took the edge off a bit. So I'm currently learning Welsh at the moment. I'm learning the Welsh language. I really want to become fluent and it is frustrating as fuck. I forgot what the process of learning something from scratch is like, where everything seems unfamiliar, you forget things all the time, you mess things up, I constantly fuck the words up, I get them in the wrong order and things like that. And it reminded me of what it must have been like to read because now I'm so used to it, I forget what it's like to be in that phase of life where Everything was really unfamiliar and it felt really, really annoying and, you know, fucking frustrating all the time. So my first piece of advice is time and patience. Because of that experience, I know what it's like. I know I will get there one day and I'll become fluent in Welsh if I have the patience for it and determination to do it. So time and patience, it will happen and you will get to a point one day where you will feel you are completely fluent. You can read everything and anything you get your hands on. One of my biggest fears growing up as a musician was to have a newly presented chart and being asked to run it down and play it upon first sight. That was fucking terrifying to me. I hated it, I would lose sleep over it at the thought of going into an audition the next day and things like that. And I'm sure and I know for a fact that is also a fear of a lot of musicians that I've spoken to through this job and people who reach out asking about the reading levels and stuff like that. And so because it scared the shit out of me growing up in music uh, and, and for a lot of my development in music, naturally I did fuck all about it. I did nothing about it. I let it fester and it just got worse and the fear grew until the point where I, had, uh, I will speak about it in a minute. <laughs> So I could read relatively well if I was given time with the material. If I was given time to prepare a reading piece, I could do it, but it was always that fear of being given a new chart with a new track that I'd never had before and I had to run it down and it had to be almost perfect. That was the thing that scared the shit out of me. And to be honest, a lot of my reading development, I was blagging, I was kind of making it up as I went along. I wasn't really following the correct bass drum patterns. I wasn't keeping it structured. Hits always terrified me, you know, and I, it was my deepest desire to be able to fill around hits, fill into hits, rather than just go boom, get boom, get, like I wanted to go boom, get that, get boom, you know, like you want to be able to do those things and do them comfortably, and this comes with being able to be comfortable enough to be able to read well enough so that you can read into those things anticipating them. I also never really understood the note values truly for what they were. I understood what subdivisions were and I could play them, but I never had a very deep understanding like I do now, but that was only through persistence. And I, you know, I the, the thing was, I always wanted to read really well. I always wanted to, I just never really give it the time of day it deserved. So when I was 19, I was very lucky enough to be sent to Berklee College of Music's five week summer program 
Uh, Berklee College of Music, for those that don't know, is the number one contemporary music school in the world. They did a five-week summer program. If you can go and afford it, do it. It was amazing. I met some wonderful people. I got some invaluable lessons. But they had this thing called the All-Star Band. American as fuck, I know. And it was kind of like the best of the best. They get chosen. You go through three rounds of auditions. You get to play in front of the whole school and faculty at the end of the five-week summer program. You get like individual mentorship, all that cool shit. And I really fucking wanted to be in it. And so I did the first audition, which was a prepared piece, which went fine because I'd already prepared something. I did the second audition, which was a very simple reading piece, which you also had time with. But the third one, you guessed it, it was in front of the drum faculty. It was my worst fucking nightmare. They put a chart in front of me. They said, you have two minutes to look down the chart, put these headphones in, and you are gonna play the track from top to bottom. And I absolutely fucked it. Oh my God, it was awful. It was fucking mortifying to know you were fucking it up in front of these fucking megastar players and just trying to amble your way through <laughs> through this chart. And honestly, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was just playing what I thought was right and I could tell they were like looking at me thinking that it wasn't right and it was so fucking embarrassing. Uh, I would love to see that chart now because I'm sure it is much less daunting. It's almost like that roller coaster when you're a kid and it seems like the biggest thing in the world and you go back uh, as an adult and it's a fucking toy train thing going around a small track. You know, it's like that kind of effect. Um, but yeah, so that was like mortifying. And so I was like, oh, okay, now I'm going to get my reading up, blah, blah, blah. And so I tried to delve into like music theory and I tried to go down that route of like buying all music theory books and all that shit. And none of that worked because I just found it so insanely boring. I've always had this thing where if I'm interested in something, I will look into it and I'll research it and I'll do my best with it. But, but if I don't like it, I'm not interested, I just won't do the work. I can't, it's always kind of been like that. And so I had to find a niche, which I'll go on to in a minute. But years later, I'm talking years of full music education at university where my reading started to grow, you know, gradually over time. It was always prepared pieces, and so I never put myself under the strain of learning something straight away. But it was years later, I had come out of university and I'd done my master's degree and all those sorts of things, and I'd done really well. And then I went to a cruise line audition, my first cruise line audition with a big cruise line company, and it happened again. They put a fucking chart in front of me, which was smoothed by Rob Smith and Santana, which now you, I can fucking play in my sleep. But they put that in front of me, but it was a condensed version. Um, and they asked me to do the same thing. Read it down, play it again. And like, I fucked it up all over again. It was humiliating, like I couldn't believe it. And so I think that is when it clicked and I was like, fuck this, like that enough is enough. I am a I'm just so over living in this shadow of this one event that has kind of dominated my life now. And so that was the catalyst moment that I was like, fuck this, I'm gonna go balls to the walls and I'm gonna learn how to read really well. So the main question that I get asked in this job now of working on cruise ships, I've been with Carnival Cruise Line now for four years and I've been very lucky enough and I've worked very, very fucking hard to get the last two inaugurals that I've done. I'm currently on the Carnival Celebration inaugural contract and I just finished Mardi Gras last year. The two biggest questions I get asked, one, is where's the food? <laughs> no. Um, the first one is how much reading is involved with your job. And the second one is how do I improve my reading skills? So that is the basis for this vlog. I thought I would take those questions and put them into a vlog. So in a few words, for the first question, how much reading is involved? A lot, a shit ton of reading is involved. And the second question, how do I improve? That's why we're at this vlog. On a normal cruise ship contract, you can play anywhere up to 200 to 250 songs per week. These will be varying in genre, styles, tempos, feels, everything that is different about music, you will be playing it. Naturally, with this amount of material, you are never ever gonna be able to learn it by heart. So the best thing to do is get your reading up to a very good standard where you can read at a very short notice and you can read multiple different styles like I said, in different tempo genres, playing, styles, fields, all that shit. If you're working in theatre, you obviously will get a bit more time ahead, but maybe not so much if you are being asked to read very short notice. 
If you're working in pit orchestras or film orchestras, I have heard that it is very, very last minute. You will get the chart on the day and you will have to play at the level that they expect to be put onto the big screen or for TV series. This, this is very, very, very high pressured situations. So you do not want to left, like, leave yourself short with your poor reading ability. I, was, I have a friend actually, I was speaking to a friend recently who is playing on a major theatre tour right now in the UK. Uh, he plays to an insanely elite level and he was saying that he had to take some time off recently so he was looking for depths or people to stand in his place. And he was asking people to go in on three days notice for this monumentally big show. So that is the reality of the situation. I say this not to scare you, but I say this to prepare you for real life. This is what is actually happening out there. There are jobs that will require you to read in very, very, very short notice. So the more prepared you can be, the better. So I will stop waffling soon, I promise. But the good news is that you do not have to suck at reading forever. It is not something you are doomed with forever. This is something that you can improve on over time. And it is something that is quite essential to your development. It just takes a lot of hard work and even more patience. So there are many, 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 many online resources uh, teaching you how to read music. So I advise doing those. But if you, if you cannot read music at all, like you can't read a note of music, I would highly, highly advise that you go and see someone about it. You go and see a tutor or you get online uh, tutelage. I would say you need to start from a foundation like that. You need to start with someone being able to help you, give you all of that information. More of my tips are if you've already got a foundation in reading and that you can read to a decent level already or you're kind of like an intermediate. So you want to get good at reading. You're sick of hearing me waffle on about my tragic audition tales and so we are getting there I promise but just before I delve in I think it's really important to cover where to get charts from over the time that I've spent on cruise ships we obviously have had access to multiple multiple thousands of charts you know if you do 250 songs a contract you may only repeat 100 of those so every new contract you're getting you know 150 new charts which is really cool, but where to get charts from? I have been sending out charts for the last few years, but due to Wi-Fi and the restrictions that are kind of set against me to set, I can never send out anything I get given by the company for copyright reasons. So most of the charts that I send are ones I've found online myself. So where my first thing I'm gonna talk about is where to get charts from for yourself. So luckily for you, I did a video on this very recently. It is aptly titled, Where to Find Drum Charts. Again, this information is universal. You can also use this if you are if you play any other instruments. It, the, the concepts are exactly the same. So besides how much reading is involved, how do I get good at reading, and you know, where's the Lido deck, or where do you live on the ship? Those are the main questions that we get asked. Aside from that, the biggest question is how do I find my own charts? Where do I get charts from? So I did a whole video on it. I'll link it in the bio. People have hopefully found it useful so far. Um, I linked over 20 individual drum, different drum pages where I personally find my charts from. Um, but just to very, very quickly skim over it, obviously go and watch the video if you want, a, if you want a more in-depth uh, review of where to find drum charts or where to find charts in general. But the main thing is just, is just knowing what to do. Just literally go on Google, type in drum charts or drum transcriptions or guitar charts or guitar transcriptions. Write charts or transcriptions after whatever instrument you have and then do a deep dive into all of those. There will be thousands of resources online for it. Uh, you can even be very specific. So say if you're, you know, you're learning September by Earth, Wind and Fire, type in September, Earth, Wind and Fire, drum chart, drum score, drum sheet music, you know, um, any of that stuff, that stuff, you know, like Lady by Tom Jo, I don't know, I'm fucking what. Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, guitar score, guitar transcription, whatever. You know, some are paid and some are not. You'll find differences in the chart quality if they're paid or not. Chart qualities will differ per author. This is very important because you don't want to get used to reading one style of chart. On cruise ships, you might read charts written by a thousand different people, all that have their own shorthand or whatever. So the more charts you can get your hands on, the better. This is essential to the next phases of what I'm doing. You need to amass a lot of charts first before we go into being able to read them next. Like, you know, just like different books, different writing styles in novels, say, like J.K. Rowling writes completely differently to Stephen King. It's the same in charts, it's the same, it's the same in sheet music. Different authors will write different, they'll write in different shorthands, they'll use different, they'll put diff things on different, you know, different um, staffs, you know, things like that. They might put a ride on the top, they might put a ride on the line. 
it might be different. The more you can get your hands on, this is essential. The more you can write, get your hands on, the better. Get them in as many differing styles, genres, feels, players, anything. Try and amass a big, big chunk of charts before you do this. Okay, so following on and finally getting into the bulk of what I want to talk about. The first thing I'm going to talk about is amassing charts and resources. So the biggest game changer for me was when I stopped seeing reading charts and charts in general and reading music as a chore, as something related to school or homework or something I was forced to do. I fucking hated school and I hated being told what I could and couldn't learn, how I could and couldn't learn it. It was infuriating. So when, you know, the minute I switched that in my brain, it was kind of like one day I was like, well, if I just stop seeing it as like homework or whatever. And, I, and, and so I was like, well, how do I do that? So what I did is I started seeking out things that I was genuinely very, very interested in. Something that kind of like lit a fire under my ass that I was really excited about. So what I did, I'm so obsessed with becoming a very, very, very elite level player. So what did I do? I, I was very obsessed with the elite level players. So what did I do? I found their charts and I found their transcriptions from clinics, solos, drum festivals, anything like that, you know, Zildjian Live, Vic Firth Gems. I just went into a deep dive of those things and I just looked up all my favorite players. Stanley Randolph, Benny Greb, uh, Jojo Mayer, Dave Wackel, you know, J-Rod Sullivan, all of these monster players, Tony Royster, you know, these guys, I just looked up them and I looked up as many charts of theirs that I could get my hands on. This is where I started. This is my biggest advice to you is make that switch. That's the first thing you need to do is make that switch in your brain. So stop looking for things that you, you find boring. I fucking hate jazz music. I'll say it, I'll put it out there. I don't like it that much. It, that doesn't mean I can't play it and that doesn't mean that I've learned it to get by in the jobs that I have taken. But I don't enjoy it, so why would I go through John Riley's Art of Bop, you know, just to say that I'd done it and fucking be sitting there and like wanting to poke my own eyes out, you know? That, and so that was the first thing I did is I looked into things that I was very, very interested in, things that were happening in the real world, not just in these drum books that were used for educational purposes. They can be very useful, but they did not kind of ignite that in me where I really wanted to learn to read and learn to read better. So upon amassing charts, the first thing I did was I obviously did my own deep dives on the internet. The second thing I did, and this is another useful thing for you, is use your resources. If you were in a music college or a music school or you've been to music school or anything like that, use your friendship circle, use your resources. Reach out to your friends, ask them to send you charts, ask them to send you as many charts as they can. If they're very kind, they will do so. Ask people from ships if you know them, theatre shows, anything, anything you can get your hands on it is beneficial at this point. Like I said, the first thing I did was looked up drum clinics. Drum clinics, I absolutely love them. I think they're fucking amazing. I love what these players are doing, what they can do. And so that's the first place I started. Luckily, I found a guy called Tim Buell, who I'll talk on a lot more in depth later on, who personally I think is the best drum charter on the planet. He would transcribe every single note of these players, drum clinics or Vic Firth jams or Zildjian lives, you know, all of those things, he would he would hand transcribe them. And so I would get those charts and I would literally, like I would just start amassing them everywhere I could. So as I wanted to play in pantomimes and on cruise ships next and some theater work and function gigs, that's where I went next. So I was like, what is the requirement for those guys? The requirement for pop gigs um, and function gigs is obviously disco and pop and rock and stuff like that. So I started amassing those charts. I started looking up you know, the set list. I asked my friends who were in functions bands for their set list. I asked friends who were in pantomimes for their for their set list. And I just went, you know, one by one. And I just downloaded those charts. So I started amassing these charts that got me excited. That was the first phase of, of my reading, kind of my substantial reading journey. And then after that, I downloaded drum books and any educational material that was going to aid in those things. So say in pantomime, say if there was um, like a waltz, say that like say there was like a funny waltz that the villain and the um, you know I don't know the fucking cat from Dick Whittington do, you know where they're back to back and they're trying to look for each other, you know that stupid shit. Say if that was like a waltz, then I would buy a drum book on waltzes to try and get the foundation of what they were trying to achieve over here. When you've got the foundation here, it means you can add more over here and you have a firmer understanding of this. 
The next thing, uh, just this is not a jump off point, but the next thing is you, it is very essential to, when you're amassing these charts, I'm talking about electronically amassing them. You can amass them in paper form and you can print them off, but you will be left with thousands of pieces of paper, which is not just like, you know, tree hugging, bad for the environment. But it is really impractical. So when you're on these gigs, when I first did my first theater gig, when I met my friend in Cheltenham, is I was like, no, I want the paper forms because that's what I was used to. That's all I'd ever worked with. He was like, you need to buy an iPad and you need to download a program called Fourscore, which all the pros are using. I was like, no, I want to use the paper stuff. So I was fumbling with my paper and I had this like method of doing it. And you know, every time I play, then I'd have to like physically grab the paper and turn the page. It was just a fucking nightmare looking back. So it was only when I joined cruise ships that I, I bought an iPad because we had 225 charts on my first contract. I bought an iPad and I downloaded Fourscore. If you don't have an iPad, I would strongly, strongly suggest getting one. And immediately after you buy your iPad, download the program Fourscore, F-O-R-C-F-O-R-S-C-O-R-E, <laughs> F-O-R-S-C-O-R-E, Fourscore. It is the number one music reading program on the planet. It is the best in my opinion. I did an entire tutorial on it, an hour long in depth run through of everything you need to know using Fourscore um, on my YouTube page, which I'll also link in the bio to this video. So it allows you to edit charts. It allows you to amass thousands of charts. I have, I think 3000 charts on my iPad now that I've amassed over the years. Um, it allows you to annotate them. So when you buy your iPad, I would strongly advise buying the Apple Pencil. It seems like a ripoff, but it's not. It's super useful. Um, like I said, I do a deep dive into Fourscore on there, but it'll, basically the basic foundation of it is it allows you to amass charts and edit them much, much, much better than you would be able to uh, handwriting everything. So the next mind switch that I had to go through was, so I'd amassed all my charts. I was really excited, you know, it's like that thing. It's very different when you, you know, it's easy to get a musical instrument and think, oh God, it's so exciting. And you know, I'm gonna set my drum kit up. And then it's a very different reality to playing it and learning and learning the instrument and being dedicated. You know, those are two very different things. So I was all excited. I got all my charts together. The next thing I had to switch my mind from was seeing reading as like a chore. And so luckily because we had done that first phase of finding charts that I was really interested in, that's just where I started. And I just switched my mind. I switched from seeing reading as this homework, boring ass chore that I had to do. I just switched it so that I was reading, reading charts like I was reading books, like I was reading threads on Twitter, like I was reading blogs, tweets, Facebook statuses. I just treated it like that. I would just look, I would read it. You know, I read them often and I read them a lot. So I would read them as often as I could. I read them often and I read them a lot. I read them on the tube to work. I would read them before bed. I would read them on the train, on the planes, on buses, in cars, at home. Anytime I could, I was reading drum charts. And I genuinely believe this exposure to that, that amount of charts in that amount of time, amassing as many charts as I could and reading them as often as I could and reading them before bed. And any time I had, I was reading drum charts. That is what, that's where the difference was made. I promise you, that is where the difference was made. Because I understood, I started to read, I started to recognize patterns, I started to, you know, I started to really delve deep into being able to read because I was doing it a lot and often and anywhere I could. So when I say I read them, the first thing I would do is read them like a book without any music. I would just read the chart as it was, bar by bar, working out, playing the sounds in my head. What does that sound like? Blah, blah, blah. The next phase that I would go into would I would listen with music, obviously, because then it contextualizes what you're reading. So I would re I would listen to music bar by bar, obviously following along, which contextualizes it. But I strongly advise you do both because you also, you need to be able to hear the notes without the music being played because otherwise you're getting a room and you'll be so used to only hearing it within a musical context, you won't be able to do it without having a musical context and vice versa. You also need to be able to hear it with music. So I strongly advise reading it without music and reading it with music. Because more often than not, especially on cruise ship gigs, we do alter a lot of the charts. And sometimes if you're in a room and it'll be, you know, let's take um, Rhiannon by Fleetwood Mac. You know, if you're playing and they want to add a hit uh, in the chorus, say, they're going to say, okay, uh, band, we're going to add a big hit, a big accented note on the end of three uh, on the chorus. Uh, is everyone good? Yeah, okay, so you're gonna notate that, you're gonna write that in your chart, but you need to be able to hear that 
without any con without any context yet. So you need to go, okay, one, two, three, bow. You need to be able to hear that. You need to be able to hear that that's what's going on in order to then set, be able to help set yourself up. So you might go, bow, two, two, bow. Um, you know, you, you, you want to be able to hear it without the context in order to be able to put it in the context. And that helps when you read without music. So after a while, after a while of doing this and after a while of reading, you will begin to recognize patterns. Patterns in the music. So you'll be able to recognize if a drum fill goes da 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 you and, and at first you've never seen that phrasing before so you you know you're working it out and blah 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 and you know it feels a bit unfamiliar at first and to read it down doesn't look that familiar but after a while you start to recognize patterns across certain things so then when new charts are presented to you you just you recognize the pattern you think oh that's the same fill as baga ba dum bum bum that was the same as i did in in that other chart or that other 20 charts that I've just done. So it becomes familiar. So then when you're playing, you're playing something for the first time, you're reading it down and you're like, oh fuck, that's so familiar. It just means you can play it much sooner. And there comes a time where you'll become so good at this, you will seamlessly do it. And then there'll be one day where you think, fuck, at some point, this really tripped me up. You know, this, this drum fill, I never would have been able to read that before. But now, you know, it, oh, it's just that, you know? Oh, it was just, um, it was just that, it was just da da bum bum That's all it was, that's literally, you know, now I know it, but that shows your development, that shows how far you've come with your reading. When you're reading a chart down, you're reading ahead a bit, and you think, oh, okay, I can play that, and then you just play it, and it's seamless, or you fill around it, that's when you really know you have a firm grasp of reading. So as an extra layer, and this came a lot later, probably only in the last two years, when I was reading drum charts, it's really important, and it's really cool, and it's the same across any chart, on any musical instrument to take ideas that you see to their base form and find out where they came from and the multitude of different ways that you can spin them and change them. So to give you an example, I was reading a chart recently by the drummer Chris Coleman and he was doing a six tuplet, which is six notes in a beat. And so he was doing that, but he was diddling the last note. So technically it was seven beats in the, in the bar, but it was diddling the last note. So it went, da ga da da ga da ga ga da 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 ga And I'd never seen that before. I'd seen diddles done before, but I'd never seen it done with sextuplets. And it sounded amazing, and it, obviously because he's so great. But it sounded amazing. I was like, where the fuck did he get that from? I just couldn't, I couldn't, I was like mind blown about how he'd done this. And so I did, so I took it back and I said, okay, so Benny Greb has... Um, this thing, I call it the accent cycle now, but it's basically when you cycle through 16th notes. So you'll play the first, second, third, and fourth, and then the next one down, you'll play the first two, and then the middle two, it'll, you know, it's like, it'll, it'll goes down in like a grid um, on his language of drumming book. And so I was like, oh, maybe it's in there because he has a section on diddles in there. And so he didn't, he only had diddles for, for 16th notes. And so I was like, okay, maybe I'll look up sex tuplet diddles then. And there was nothing. So what I did is I, because I can read and I can write, is I just learned to write and I wrote my own diddle six chart. So the one he was playing was on the top of the page. Da, 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 da. And so obviously I just then continued to write out the entire diddle chart of all of the variations of the different six tuplet diddles you can do. Again, which gives you a massive, massive advantage because you think, well, okay, if he diddled the last note, what if I diddled the first or the second or the third or the fourth? What if I mixed them up? What if I diddled the, the first and the sixth? What if I diddled the second and the fourth? You, and this is where you begin to develop your own style and your own voicing. You have taken an idea that you have seen because you can read and you've taken it to the base level and all of these options and you can then work those through yourself and make them your own. This is absolutely invaluable advice and information to your development. So you can see how the rabbit hole gets deeper the more that you read. Just like, you know, they say if you read a book and they recommend a book or every book recommends five books or something like that. There's a quote out there somewhere. It's exactly the same. You'll read a drum chart and you'll get an idea and you'll be like, oh fuck, I'd never seen that before. I've never thought about it like that before. And then take it back, take it out of context, take it back to its original original state and you will, you will be able to learn it at a much, much different level and rate. So this point is somewhat obvious, but you need to also listen along with the track. 
as important as it is to read stuff without, it is also just as important to read with. So if it's a song you're learning for a gig, you need to listen, but you need to actively listen. So actively listening is listening out for things that, like nuances, so things that you might not pick up from a first listen or from or that the chart might neglect. Listening to a song whilst following along gives you excellent perspective on time, feel, groove, touch, you know, where they go, what mood they're trying to create, all those things you will get from listening to the recording whilst also following along with the track. So although notes on a page might distinguish between a massive accent and a ghost note, they won't always discern the very nuanced things like a center of the head shot or a rim shot or um, or how loud, you know, not every note is gonna be a accent, you know, massive accent or a ghost note. You know, some of them are very in the middle and this is not always notated when you, like more often than not, it's not notated when you are reading. So for example, something like with nuanced listening, and with active listening, it can be things like, does she play the center of the head? Does she play a rim shot? Does she play a heavy accent? How light are her ghost notes? Are some of her ghost notes louder than her other ones? Uh, you know, on the hi-hat, does she use the shaft of the stick or does she use the tip? Same with the bell. Does she use the tip of the stick on the bell, on the ride bell or does she use the shaft on the ride bell? Is she digging into the ride? Is she digging into the hi-hat? Or is she just over the top? Or is she, you know, those things are nuanced listening. Those things are very in-depth listening, which will change your sound completely. It can change the entire sound of an entire track, of your time feel, of everything. Those things, those delved into nuances can make a huge difference and make your sound more individual than the next player. I promise you, the minute you start very, very actively listening to those, those tracks and those drums and, you know, does she play into the bass drum? Does she play out? You know, all those things are just so, so important to the sound and to your individual makeup as a musician. You know, even things, even small things when you watch, and this is another this is another thing, this is why you also need to watch sometimes, watch live videos, watch, you know, studio recordings and stuff. It's like, which way around do they hold their stick when they do a cross stick? Some people, you know, flip the stick around and they use the butt end, some people use the top end. You know, those will make a difference to your sound completely. You know, those small things all make up to a bigger picture. It's like a compound effect. You know, each small thing, if you know, if you played into the bass drum and then you did a rim shot and then you did, you know, shaft of the stick in the hi-hat and then you did like shaft of the stick on the bell, is all gonna make a massive difference to the overall sound rather than if you did the tip for all of those things. And also then it's very important that you mark those on your charts because that's gonna help, that's gonna help set you apart as a player, I promise. It will set you apart completely, you know, Learning those styles and learning those nuances is so important. So like, you know, I watched a video recently with Stanley Randolph who plays for Stevie Wonder. And obviously as Stevie Wonder played on most of his track recordings, Stanley Randolph had to almost learn how to re replay or, you know, learn how to hold the, the stick a different way because Stevie Wonder wasn't, wasn't technically trained. He just held it the way he thought sounded good. So Stanley Randolph then had to change his technique to play and get the same sound as Stevie Wonder did. And so those things are so wildly important and they will very much set you apart and people will notice, I promise. So you need to make the, make sure you're marking those on your chart. I'll go on to marking after the next section, um, but you need to mark those things. They are very, very important. So dynamics, this is something that very, very often gets neglected as well in the cruise ship industry, I find. Not so much in theatre because that's, there's, a lot, there's a much bigger strain on people talking with needing an underscore. That's something I found in Panto and when I did youth music theatre, which I highly advise as well. Do youth music theatre if you can because you get, you get to play with charts, you get to do live music, play with other musicians, play for an MD. Great experience. I did that, I think, when I was 16, I think. Or 17, maybe. Um, so dynamics. Dynamics are very important, but they often get neglected in um, in pop music and rock music and all those other styles that we play on the ships. So don't neglect dynamics. Dynamics are there for a reason. Dynamics will always be marked on good charts. They will be marked beneath each section. Make sure you are highlighting them to the fucking nines and make sure you are there, you are really emphasizing those. So if it says mezzo piano in the intro, play mezzo piano. If you know what mezzo piano is, spend time looking into dynamic markings. It will, again, these are all things that are gonna set you apart as a player. People will want to play with you if you have an understanding of these things and you get an understanding because you can read. So dynamics are there for a reason. They help create a feel, they help create a mood, they help the song flow. They are so insanely important and you only notice them 
I ironically, when they're not there, it shows that you are a very mature musician and that you don't have to play fucking bashing away the whole song, which not only is physically exhausting, but it's emotionally exhausting as well. If the song calls for it and the song is in met or is in the song is in double forte or fortissimo for the entire song, then then do that. You know that's because that's the instruction that is asked of you. But if you're only hitting forte in the choruses, but the the verses are, you know, the verses are mezzo forte, then you need to show that dynamic switch. If a bridge is piano or mezzo piano, you need to show that, you need, you need to be able to have the ability to do that. There are some wonderful resources out there in terms of physically being able to play dynamics on a drum kit. Most of these I find are with Benny Greb. He, oh God, I fucking love that guy. Um, probably my biggest I, he's my favorite I think of everyone his the way he thinks about it his technique his feel his the way he talks about it just love him um, and so he talks a lot in, in his DVDs download everything he has because it is only gonna make you a better musician he talks in depth about um, dynamics and volume control and being able to be aware of, of your volume control um, and so yeah, that is something I would advise is deep diving into the different dynamic markings and really working on those. So you need to identify, mark and look up and really get to grips and practice a lot with dynamic markings. Go from loud to quiet, quiet to loud, everything in between, you know, really practice the jumps in in um, dynamic markings. Another person who's really good for this is Mark Juliana, who I, I'm a massive fan of as well. His book, Exploring Creativity on the Drum Set, I highly advise buying that one too, because he does talk about going through the different uh, dynamic ranges. He's got an entire chapter on dynamics, come to think of it, and it is amazing. You can do it on your iPad, you can download it offline. Um, all of these resources actually you can do offline and download to four score. And so I highly advise doing that too. Um, and really, really diving into dynamics because again, it will set you apart, I promise. People will notice. So the first thing I do when I get a new chart is I mark them. And when I say I mark them, I go into marking it in depth on my four score tutorial, but I will speak about it in this chapter. On a first read through of a chart, I mark everything that I will talk about in a second. Then I, so I do a first initial read through, then I go back and I identify anything that I think will throw me off. Usually for me, this will involve hits or stabs as they're called. Um, if you, when I speak about marking, mark them on your iPad with your Apple Pencil, or if it's, uh, if, you're using, if you're going old school and you're using a pencil, use a pencil to mark them in. So like tracks like Brick House for our Motown set, you know, that drum fill, in the, that intro drum fill has to be played note for note. So I would mark that, I would mark what the notes are above the above the notation, and then I would mark any hits that I think will throw me off. So like usually that'll be on like the E of a beat, or the A of a beat, or the and, or if it's like one and two, the E of two, you know, the and of three, all that shit. I mark that just so it's very visual for me, uh, which I'll show you in a sec. So it looks like this, so I will notate, this is This Christmas by Donny Hathaway. This is really simple and everyone will develop, you, this, it's very important to develop your own shorthand or your own way of doing this. This is something I've developed over a very long time. So I write it in directly above the phrase. If you can see there, one and, and then the and I've highlighted because that's the hit, and then 40 and the, um, because upon first sight that might be a bit difficult or might might throw me off a bit or something like no matter how simple it is I think the most important thing here is that no matter how you mark it mark it for you no one else is reading your charts you're not getting graded on your chart fucking marking so make sure on the first mark through if you are going to use this method mark anything that is going to throw you off especially if you have time in an audition to do that take a pencil because usually they will do it in paper form Take a pencil so you can rub it out at the end and just really quickly mark what, you know, any hits that you think are gonna throw you off. That would be the first thing that I would always do. Then next I would go through and mark all the passages of the song. So if we take a different song, let's do Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Um, so then I would mark through all the sections where there are changes. So verse, chorus, intro, pre-chorus, all that shit. I would mark those to make sure that when I'm reading ahead, I know exactly what section and what intention I am going for in the next sections, whether that's an increase in volume, decrease in volume, feel, tempo, any of that stuff. So some of them already have them done and some of them don't. If they don't, I'd strongly advise marking them in. If it'll focus. See, verse, pre-chorus, chorus. chorus. 
So you know when you're reading ahead, I mark them in blue. I'll talk about colors in a bit. Um, I mark them in blue so I know I can read ahead and know that that section is, there's gonna be a section change there. Then, like I explained above, I will highlight any of the different dynamic markings that are gonna be changing, whether that's from mezzo piano to piano to forte, mezzo, forte, fortissimo, all of that stuff. I will make those dynamic markings in pink because pink for me will be my, um, you know, I need to pay attention to it. Then I mark odd bar numbers. So actually don't stop me now, it's perfect. Odd bar numbers meaning anything that is out of the norm. So the norm is usually eight to 16 bars phrases or 12 bar if it's a blues. Anything outside of that is kind of odd and not very eye-catching. If you're used to reading charts that are always written with eight bar phrases or four bar phrases or whatever it is, you know, or 12 bars, anything outside of that will you might read it and you might play it wrong because it might not it might not be discernible on the chart without it. If I show you an example, so on this Don't Stop Me Now chart, if I was just reading the verse in an audition, if I was asked to play this down, if I didn't know the song, obviously I know the song, everyone knows it. If you're reading that down, if you look at the verse, pay attention to the verse there. So if you're reading that down, your mind can trick you into thinking that is an eight bar phrase because that's what we're used to playing. We've always played it, that's kind of like our bread and butter. But you will be really surprised how often that will catch you out if you do not make a note of it, if you not are paying attention to the fact you are having to count those bars. And you will look like a massive fucking tool if you do not play those bars correctly. If you come into the you know, chorus strong and you're on the ride two bars before everyone else, you look like an idiot. Um, and it's happened to me before and that's why now I do this. So if, if you look at the same, of what I just showed you. As you can see now, I have clearly marked that there are odd bar numbers. So there's a fifth bar and a ninth and a tenth bar in the phrase before the next bit. In yellow, because obviously for them, because yellow, I was gonna say obviously, you don't know that. Obviously for me, yellow means odd bar numbers or repeats. So then I will make a marking of any changes in instrumentation. So it'll be, if you are going from a verse to a chorus and you go from a hi-hat to a ride, if you're on a good chart like this one, I mean, this one's amazing. This will even give you whether it's fucking closed or open hi-hat, um, which is really cool, but not every chart does that. Uh, I would say more often than not, the charts don't do that. So you wanna make those markings there too. You wanna mark above the next phrase, ride, and then next verse, you wanna go hi-hat or whatever. Basically, you wanna do it so that when you are playing the chart down, it is so comprehensive and it is so glaringly obvious to you what you're about to do next that you don't make any mistakes. You know, it is very clear. Okay, I'm in the ride, look ahead. Okay, I'm going back to the hi-hat on this because I've written it in. Everything is written. I know I have a 10 bar phrase, so I'm gonna look out for it. I'm gonna be aware that I'm coming into a 10 bar phrase. It feels really even familiar. You know, you just don't want to be caught unawares. Like, I, I find it mad when I read other people's charts and they don't mark anything. I find it wild how they can, how they are on top of everything. If they are a very good reader, obviously they will be, but then when they start making consistent mistakes, you think, well, maybe that's because you didn't mark it properly. You know, it becomes so comprehensive that it, it'll allow you to breeze through the passages of verse and chorus. You're just breezing through it. You fill at the right time. You fill into the things at the right time. You play all the odd bar numbers with intention, not like you're kind of unfamiliar about, oh, are we actually, are we there yet? Are we fucking, have I played that eighth bar? Have I played the ninth bar in the phrase yet? You fucking know you haven't because you've highlighted it. It's, you know, it's very, very clear. You change tempos where it states and so on and so on. It really, I can't stress this enough, it really doesn't matter what your charts look like, no one gives a shit. They're your charts, you know. It's not like you have to show them off to everyone, like, oh, you know, can you grade me on my chart? You know, the MDs don't give a fuck. As long as you play it right, and you play it down, and it matches up, and it matches up with everyone else, it sounds great because you've done your work. No one gives a fuck, I promise. So. Do whatever you want with your charts, but as long as you're playing them, starting at the right time, stopping at the right time, filling into the hits, doing everything as you should be, it doesn't matter what your chart looks like, it really doesn't, and I can, I am 100% testify to that. The only caveat to that is like I just said, if you're an audition, obviously take a pencil, don't highlight anything. Take a pencil so that it can be rubbed out because they, they frequently they will reuse that chart for everyone else in the audition that day, and I know it would piss you off if someone had notated it wrong and they hadn't scribbled it out and then you played it wrong. <laughs> you don't wanna be in that position. So that's the only caveat to what I just said.
Another thing that crops up quite often, and this often will catch people out, including myself, if, you know, before I would, before I started notating things, was changes on a page turn. This meaning, you can you can change it now on your on Foursquare so that you do a split page, so you're already looking ahead to the next page whilst finishing the last. I fucking hate it. I can't do it. The horn players in my band love it. They always do it, but I can't do it. Changes on a page turn basically means so you come to the end of a phrase. I'll find you a chart now. You come to the end of a phrase. So at the end of your page, and that's the end of the eight bars, and then immediately on the top of the next page is the next, so like a verse or a chorus or something like that. So what I do is I write in the bottom right-hand corner of the page, I write in that there will be, yeah, that there will be a change. So this one is Last Christmas by Ariana Grande, which we are playing next week. In the bottom right hand corner, you can see that I wrote chorus with a little with a little arrow pointing whoop. with a little with an arrow with a little um with a little arrow pointing to the next page, which means immediately next is a chorus. I've done this before when you have breakdowns on the next page, so you'll put breakdown four on the floor kick or something because sometimes you need to be able to, you need to you're still reading the end of the phrase if there might be a big fill or hits or whatever that you haven't memorized yet, there might be those things that you need to read. So then you don't want to be caught unawares when you go to the next page. You're fucking still bashing your way through thinking it's the chorus, but it's not. It's a breakdown and you're only on kicks. Those things. So then that's what I will write in. Like I said, you know, there are ways around it if you wanted to split your page, but I don't really like doing that. So just to circle back and just to reiterate this very important point is the nuances within the music. I cannot stress this enough. Very great players talk about it. JP Bouvet, I saw, talked about it recently, is nuance, nuanced listening and nuanced playing. These are the things that will set you apart. So the difference between a rim shot and striking the center of the head is strikingly different for the feel and the sound of the music. It'll create a different mood for the song and it will honestly, it'll change everything. I had a drum lesson I had a series of drum lessons with Doug Harper, who is the Book of Mormon drummer in London. He's done a bunch of other really, really big time stuff. And I went for a drum lesson with him and we were playing stuff through, we were playing a bunch of stuff. He was like, you know, you don't always have to hit the rim. You don't always have to hit a rim shot, mind. And I was like, I was like, what? He was like, you know, you can hit the center of the head. You can hit slightly off center. You can hit a rim shot where it like really rings out and it, you know, almost sounds like a timbale. And he showed me like six different ways to hit a snare drum. And I was like, what the fuck? Like I'd never even thought about that. And I think that was when I was really then like, fuck, okay, like, you know, this is so important. And then when I, he, I was very, very fortunate enough that he let me go and sit in and watch him play Book of Mormon. And he was, he couldn't be more right, you know, hitting the center of the head created a completely different feel for what was going on up on the stage than a rim shot did, you know, or, you know, if he dug in a tiny bit more in a certain place on the ride, it kind of signified what, what direction of the music they were taking. And, you know, really work on your dynamic changes. I saw that no more than, like I said, when I was sitting in the pits with them, I was lucky enough to sit in on Wicked and a bunch of other theater shows. And those guys really know how to take the small things and run with them. You know, know your differences between mezzo piano and piano, between forte and mezzo forte, you know, really know those subtle changes so that when you come to play, people will notice, people will notice those things. If you're, you know, you're coming in nice and strong for a, for a chorus intro or for an introduction, and then the singing comes in, naturally you should, you should ease off. If you're doing a pantomime gig or a theatre gig, you're naturally, and it's not written, naturally you're gonna ease off if someone's talking. You're not gonna be blazing your way through if there's speech, you know? Those things will set you apart, and I promise people will notice, because they've noticed it in my playing since I started doing them a few years ago. And these things will open up a whole new world of practicing for you too. You know, if you ever get stuck on practice ideas, or whenever you're practicing ideas, you will think, you'll internally think, maybe, I'm, what, maybe my left hand, what's my left hand doing? What's my right hand doing? You know, maybe I could move it so that, you know, I'm not always doing rim shots. Maybe I'll strike the center of the head for a bit. Maybe I'll do X, Y, and Z. These things will make a difference and marking them on your charts will make the difference because you will be aware. When you're learning something in the moment, it is very easy to think, Oh, I'll remember that. That's like glaringly obvious. And I've done that before. I've thought, oh, I don't have to write that in. Like, I'll remember. And then 40, 40 charts later that you've done that week and you come to playing them top to bottom again, you can't remember shit. And then you don't play them. And so it's like, 
you know, it's like mark them, mark your charts. That is the biggest, that is a very, very big piece of advice I have. So to touch on the colors thing, this is something I use a lot and I've used it kind of since I started getting a good grip on reading probably like seven or eight years ago. Uh, we have a very, very big association as human beings to color. So, you know, like think about a traffic light, you know, red means stop, amber means wait, and green means go. You know, we, we are internally, we know those things to be true. You know, like uh, working on ships, you know, uh, a, green, a green exit sign will mean that's your exit, that is safety, you know. Hazardous things will be in blue or X, Y, and Z. We are conditioned to, do, to work with color. So I just use that to my advantage. I cannot explain to you how heavily I rely on this. It is insane because this is basically what I do. So for, in my charts, green will always mean hits. So whenever I spot a green coming up, I know there's a hit coming up, whether that is a fill, you know, something to be filled into, or just a big accented hit, you know, all the band is gonna hit on the one. So, you know, for instance, in one of the Christmas songs we have coming up, on the sax solo, the minute we go into the sax solo, there's a huge hit on the one. Um, it's like this big band swing thing. Huge hit on the one. So I just mark that with a little, with a little green. If there's supposed to be a crash on, on the chain, on you know the first two bars of a, of a verse, mark it in. That is green. For yellow, I use odd bar numbers and repeats. So I will highlight, you know, I'll write the odd bar. So if it's the sixth bar of the phrase, and then we go on to a new phrase. I'll write five and six in little brackets to rep to signify the bars above the bars, what bars exactly they are, and then I'll highlight them in a little yellow. So I know if I see yellow coming up, I'm, I'm coming up to odd bar numbers. Or if I have yellow at the end and the start of a new phrase, I know that I'm gonna re be repeating those phrases with the repeat marks written in. For blue, I do sections. So re intro, verse, chorus, you know, intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, post-chorus, verse, you know, all that shit. That is blue for me. Purple will always be a pay attention. So if I write purple at the top of a phrase and I write swing, even though the chart is written as, say, like a waltz or whatever, or pop, if I know it's slightly swung, I write slightly swung and I make sure I highlight it in purple so I know that is something I have to pay attention to before I go into it. Uh, for pink, I will always use as something to pay attention to. So purple will always be like something I need to be conscious of before the song starts. Pink will always be if I transition from a hi-hat to a ride. If I, if there are fills coming up at the end of the bar that are open but not notated and I can freely fill, I will write fill and I'll highlight it in pink. Those sorts of things, it is stupidly useful to me. So I highly encourage that you develop your own system, but I would highly advise you use colors. Again, I speak about all of that shit in my four score tutorial. I show you how to do colors, how to do highlighters, all of that sort of thing. So hopefully that will be useful to you. That is the end of the reading section. That and marking and amassing charts. So we've done amassing charts, reading. Now we are moving on to playing through the charts. So once I've read them through, I've amassed, I've amassed my charts, I've read them through, I've marked them through, I've listened with music, I've listened without music, I've marked all the nuances that I need to, now it is time to play through your charts. So I do this two ways, I do it with music and without music, much like I do reading the charts, I read them without and I read them with, I play them without and I play them with. I'll explain why this is really important in a minute. So on a first playthrough, just to slightly jump off here, on a first playthrough, play it simply. I cannot tell you how much this has helped me, this piece of device has helped me. Play it through simply to begin with. Do simple, nice fills that are gonna just get you into the next sections nice and comfortably. Basically, you wanna get through the chart completely unscathed when you're doing it for a first time. This is no more important than it is in an audition. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later. You can embellish more when you're more comfortable. When you're more comfortable with the chart, you can embellish a bit more. And obviously over time you will learn that you can embellish if you are a much better reader. But when you're first starting out, read it nice and simply on the way down, you know, play it if, if it's, you know, if the groove is quite complicated and it's a bit tricky and you, you know, you can't find your way through it. Just play a nice simple groove. No one is gonna kick your ass for playing a nice groove or playing time, but hitting everything in the right places and starting and ending at the right points. So that is my first little jump off point there when you're playing it through for the first time. So when you're first playing it through, play it with music first. Like we've already discussed, this helps you get an overall feel and it helps lead you what with the intention of what the track intends you to play. 
So, also doing this will initially and immediately get you used to playing down a track for the first time with music, which is what will happen in most auditions. So, playing it down with the track uh, is really important, and playing it down for the first time upon reading it is also a really important skill that you need to develop. So, when you're playing it through with the track, first, uh, aside from all the markings you've made, go through. Um, sometimes you would have missed things, sometimes things will be trickier than you've initially anticipated. So on the, once you've done your initial playthrough, go back, mark all the sections that you found difficult. If you found it easy, great, move on to the next one. But if you found it difficult or certain passages of it difficult or you fucked up some of the sections, I would mark those and I would go back and I would, I would work on those sections in isolation with a click. Um, or work on those sections with an app called AnyTune Pro, which means you can slow down the track to like 80%, 60%, 50%, whatever. If there are really hard grooves or something that you just haven't got up to speed yet, uh, I advise using that app because it is invaluable for getting it from say 60% all the way up to tempo without feeling like a massive gradual thing and you're fucking it up from the get go and you've never really quite got the grasp of the groove, slow it down, really nail the groove, really hone it in, and then speed it up to tempo. Also, it's important to isolate sections because in an audition they might ask you to, do, to also do that. It's not uncommon that I've been in a group audition before and they've said, okay, we just want you to play from bars X to bar X, and then you click them off, and then you're in, and then you play from X to X, and that is it. So it's always handy to have a notebook present when you're doing this to mark at the end, immediately go, okay, from bar 45 to bar 60, those were the ones that I was struggling with the most, so you've got a very clear collection of what, of what you were struggling with to work on next time and in the moment. The next most important thing is to play it through without music. This is quite understated, actually. I don't find many people do this. They always just play it through with the track immediately, and then they try and get a feel for the track. This is very important as well to play it through without the track because... If you play it without the track, you are no longer reliant always on hearing certain musical cues. You know the music yourself. You know it in depth on your own. You're not waiting for a vocal cue. You're not waiting for musical cue. You're not waiting for anything. This really, really solidifies not being reliant on singers or other musicians for things that they might be adding that you're waiting for. So you, you begin to really trust your reading ability in where you are and you begin to really trust that you're, you are, you know where you are even if no one else does. And when you come to playing it with track and click and time code, not so much when you're playing it live and there's no click and track because you can veer and you can follow the singers, but when you're on click and track, there's no veering. You have to stick to the track. So this helps with that because then you're very, very solidified in your belief of where you are. There are clicks available on Fourscore which you can program in. Say, say you have bars, say you have 120 bars of the song, you can program into your metronome on four score 120 bars, the song will end. So this is kind of, you know, if you if you find it difficult to follow bars and follow them logically and, you know, you get a bit lost in the music and stuff, especially playing it without music can be a bit tricky at first. This is really helpful because it, the click will just stop and you'll be like, oh fuck, okay, that's where I was supposed to end. And if you do that enough times, that can really help. But obviously if you're reading it well and you're reading it in depth, bar by bar, logically structured, and with a click, you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to just play it down. So I advise strongly that you play it with just a click and that is it, or as much as you are playing it with the track. Also, playing it with a click and without the music, say if you're in a party band setting and even if they're not using um, tracks or click, this has happened to me recently over my break, even if they're not using track and click, and but you have done the work and you've practiced your charts with just a click, you get an internal tempo and inter an internal time feel for what that track should feel like. So you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I remember, yeah, I remember how that feels now. It feels like, it feels like this and, you know, it feels a lot more true and then you won't veer so much between, if you haven't done the work with just a click track, it won't feel like you're veering too far ahead or you're not letting the band pull you faster in the choruses or slowing you down in the verses. You're kind of sticking to your thing because you've done it with just the click. So when it comes to working on difficult passages, like I said, work on them at a slower click tempo and then get them up to click. And then when you want to do it in context with the track, then you should do with any tune pro. So you've got both contexts. So you've worked on the groove or the fill alone with just a click. So you've isolated that. And then if you want the musical context for it, you have AnyTune Pro, which slows down the track, or YouTube, 
is also useful because you can do the playback speed slower, like 75%. That really helps because you are really getting into what the groove should feel like and every single note, accuracy is so important. They say accuracy is the key to speed actually. And so if you if you do it at a much slower tempo and then you gradually five BPM at a time build yourself back up to it, it'll feel much more natural. I did this with one of the tracks that we have at the end of our opening night show. It is a Michael Jackson track. And I just couldn't get the groove for the fucking life for me. And, it, and I just had to spend hours and hours. And I was like, this is never going to feel right. And now I play it and I breeze through it because I started out much slower with accuracy and built my way up. So the next section is called not taking the chart as read. Obviously, you need to make sure you're following, like everything I've just said is completely valid. Everything. If you go, if you're giving a chart and it is as is and it has the different tempo markings and it, or it tempo changes in the track or it has different sections or breaks or fills or anything that is notated on the chart, you should be playing those as they are hits and whatever. But in my experience, 90% of the times that the charts on ships or the charts in general are written by arrangers who are multi-instrumentalist but they are not drum disciplined. And this might be the same for other instruments. So they are not, they might just program a drum track in MIDI and then the MIDI will create a drum score, but the, because percussion and all this other stuff might be on the track and, and in your chart, it, become, it becomes almost impossible to be able to play that exact, that exact groove because obviously that's not what a live drummer was playing, that was all these MIDI percussion tracks. I will show you what I mean. So as you can see here, where the orange is. Obviously you're playing hand-to-hand -hand, um, in that group, you're playing hand-to-hand -hand 16 notes. So it'd be impossible to, to like double up on a on those in order to get those tom hits in. Some of them are just written where they're really impractically written because they're not written by like from a live drummer, by a live drummer or whatever. So if you have time with it, obviously you can try and figure out what the most you can do with those things. But on a first read through like at an audition, my biggest advice is just to simplify it and play time and play it right and play it right in terms of like the form and the structure rather than the actual groove. No one is going to have a go at you for keeping good time and you can add all that fancy shit in later once you have a bit more time with it. You know, it's, it's hard to get through an, uh, like an unfamiliar chart as it is without having to try and figure out that hand to hand groove whilst trying to get those things in and if those are going to fuck you up just leave them out, you know? Like no one's gonna have a go at you if you if you leave them out, but you're just continuing to keep good time, you get the hit at the end of the bar, and then you're filling into a new phrase and that you're into the new section. No one is gonna have a go at you for that. So that is my advice, keep it simple. Obviously if you have more time with it, if it's in a band setting, work on it, and try and get as many nuances as you can. But on a first playthrough, just do what you can. So the next thing is exposure. Exposure to the real life situation is absolutely essential to your development and to your reading ability and just your overall musicianship level uh, in general. It is essential because it will light a fire under your ass to see what the real life pros are doing and what they're reading and what it's like to read out there for real, like in real life, not, not in exercise books or not in a practice room or any of that shit. It is real life. This is what they're actually reading. It, it has been an absolute game changer. Although I understand that this will be the hardest one to get to grips with and to get exposure to, it is absolutely invaluable. So it may take some time to get, but once you're in it, obviously, like they say, it's easier to get a job if you have a job. So it is, it's gonna take some time, but once you're in it, I promise it gets easier. And it's where, like I said at the very beginning of the video, it is where my reading just went to a whole new level when I was working in pantomime, working in function bands, and working on cruise ships. Because unlike before, there wasn't a pressurized situation that I was ever in, apart from auditions, um, where it was sink or swim, quite literally. It was, um, you know, you have to put that pressure on yourself sometimes. You have to manufacture a situation where you're you're under pressure like that. Um, and so you need to put yourself in a position where it's happening for real. You know, much like when you're learning a language, if you're learning it from the comfort of your bedroom and you never have to speak it, 
you're never going to be under pressure to speak it. If you put yourself in a position where you go to a rural part of fucking Spain or Wales and no one speaks English, you then have to be able to speak to a very good level very quickly in order to survive, in order to eat and speak and communicate. And it's the same in this world. Like when you put yourself in positions where you have to read well, you have to, you don't have a choice. So you will put in more hours, you will work much harder than you have before because you're, you're putting yourself under that strenuous position but I promise it's worth it. And there becomes real life consequences which more often than not will spur you on. So if you are, you know, in the studios for a, you know, big time cinematic orchestra or you're, you know, in a band room in one of the major cruise line companies or you're in rehearsals, that's when it's real and that's when, you know, there are massive consequences to if you are not reading properly or if you don't have a good level of reading, those things will come back to bite you in the ass. So these types of gigs and exposure situations include but are not limited to cruise ships, theatre gigs, the West End, Broadway, touring musicals, regional musicals, pantomimes, recording studios, youth music theatre in the UK, which I spoke about earlier, function bands, wedding bands, corporate bands, orchestra, and large-scale pop and rock gigs. Smaller-scale gigs, school theatre, school orchestras, local pub gigs, etc. These are all situations where you will be required to read more often than not, and where you will have to read, you'll read to a good level. So those are very varying for your level. So if you are just starting out playing, and you're getting your reading up, then go and do your local pub gigs. Don't go and go to youth music theatre. Get your hand. Go out in the school orchestra. Anything like that is going to help. If you are like an intermediate player, obviously, you know, find those higher level corporate bands or higher level function bands or pantomimes or whatever. If you are a more advanced player, then look for cruise gigs or theatre gigs or panto gigs or any of those things. To begin. This could be, you know, to begin with, this could even be messaging local players to go and sit in with them for panto or for theatre or for orchestras or, you know, or for if you're, you know, if you if you're lucky enough to know West End musicians or Broadway musicians, go and ask those guys if you can sit in. In my experience, more often than not, I found they are very kind and very helpful to the up and coming generation. This is where you will actually see what it's like for them to read, because then you bridge that gap. It no longer becomes this this ethereal thing of, you know, you, you, you make the dissociation because, I, you know, at the moment it's probably very easy to think, oh, well, those guys are just born with good reading ability, you know, those charts are insanely hard and insanely difficult. But then when you're put in the room with them and you start noticing patterns and you're like, oh, fuck, I, I think, given time, I think I could play that. It completely kills your fear of being able to read at those higher levels, you know, on the same level of those guys, the next thing that you do is have to catch up with their playing, you know, which those two things for me have come hand in hand. I was very fortunate enough to sit in, like I mentioned earlier, on Book of Mormon with my drum teacher, Doug Harper, and also on Wicked, but also on Avita. Because I was working on the West End uh, on the bar, I just used every, uh, every opportunity I could to speak to to speak to players um, at the bar, you know, I was working on a bar so they would come in and, and so I would speak to those players and ask them if I could sit in and sometimes you have to be a bit ballsy and, and but it's that, that was kind of a changing, a turning point in my mind because I was like, well, that's all it is. I can see the chart, I can read some of the stuff they're reading or, you know, all it's going to take is a high level of reading and, a, and a, you know, a high level of playing and hopefully one day you, you can do those same gigs. I think another one of the biggest catalyst changes for me was when I had the opportunity to dep for my friend Ben Stone playing the Cheltenham pantomime for two years <clears throat> um, in front of sold out crowds in the Everyman Theatre um, in the run up to Christmas. This again was just absolute next level exposure to the situation. I got given charts. But this was very, very, very different. So pantomime, for those that don't know, is kind of like um, a comedic theatre enactment of like a children's tale so like Cinderella, Dick Whittington, Aladdin, you know Cinderella all that shit um, and so not only as a drummer are you reading the musical score which you need to be on top of you are reading the sound effects chart because more often than not you are also making like the karate chop sounds and the fucking wizard entrance sounds and the wizard you know, spell sounds. You have to read that chart too, but you're also watching the TV monitor to make sure you're following the MD in the right places because it changes from night to night. 
and then you're also trying to listen to your relationship with the rest of the band and the click and the track and so that was like you know a fucking trial by fire um, so I would highly advise anyone who can get their hands on those gigs to do those because now I you know I, like that's I want to kind of do that every Christmas for the rest of my life it's like the best playing experience you know you, and then you go to a normal gig and you're just reading the chart and you know trying to have a good time and, and you know watching what the MD is doing that's a fucking breeze so that was hugely eye-opening and it allowed me to get some real hands-on experience in the job which obviously you can put on your CV and obviously that and then help with cruise ships because obviously you're transitioning from doing click and track and chart reading and all that other shit to the same on ships more often than not. And then speaking about ships, four years ago when I got the job with Carnival, that is just when the most exponential growth happened with my reading. I had to read well and I had to read very, very quickly and I had to read a massive amount of charts. So I spent, like I said, it was, you know, you put yourself in a position where you don't have a choice, you know, like it's either you read well or you go home. Because every day you're working through at least 10 to 12 charts per day and you're making markings and you're doing live versions and, you know, all of that stuff. And then the next day you're doing another 10 and at the end of the week you're playing through the 70 charts, you know, in a day. So you do, you have to read really well and you have to read to a very high standard and you have to also play to a high standard, but that's kind of, yeah. But you know, the more you do it, the less scary it becomes. Every day you finish and you've, you know, you've, you've done your bit and you've worked hard and you've done well and you've read and you've marked and you go home and you stay up until 3 a.m. working on the next day's charts and then you go in and you play them and you mark them and you do your bit and you you never ever want it to be you that is holding up the band. This is something that was a massive pet peeve throughout the processes that I've gone through with Carnival sometimes is the musicians who didn't put in the work the night before will be trying to do it in the room and then you're sitting there waiting. But if you're not that person, people do pick up on that. If you are always ready and you're always there and because you know the chart, because you've done your homework and you've read and you've really internalized what's going on and you've got suggestions and you've looked up live versions and you've said oh you know when they do it live they do this hit here and they do this hit here those things get noticed and it's those small things that add up and so that's why when you do those earlier on in, in your career with whatever you're doing music wise you know take the initiative it will get noticed I promise you and also when you when you are having exposure to these things like I said, and like I keep harping on about, it's the real world. It's what's actually happening. No longer are you in the realm of, you know, exercise books and classroom and homework. Your homework is what you're actually playing the next night and that you have to play well and that you have to read well. It's worth putting in all the time. Every gig, every new gig I get, I spend at least three or four days going through the charts in the exact process I have just told you about reading them down, marking them down, playing them down, making sure I have a very firm grasp, organizing them into their set list. And so that is where I've got, why I've got, where I've got, where I've got. You know, that didn't make any fucking sense. Uh, that is why I've got where I've got now. So the next thing I would do, this is slightly out of the realm of reading it down, but recording yourself is also very essential. There is time-tested advice on recording yourself as a musician, being able to hear back what you've done, record yourself playing live, record your auditions, record yourself at home, record any and every way you can. And I mean record um, audio and video, because so, you know they'll do two separate things. It allows you to, so the first thing it does is it allows you to hear what you're doing. It, hears, it allows you to hear the nuances of your playing. Like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I should come down a bit more in the verse. Maybe I don't need to be as busy in this section. But then recording yourself on the video means that you can mechanically, you can literally look at your playing and say, well, that didn't look right and that's probably why it didn't sound right. So maybe I need to work on my finger technique. Maybe I need to work on my molar technique. You know, maybe I need to work on this, maybe I work on slide or scales, or maybe I need to be a bit more fluid. It allows you to really, like, introspectively analyze what you're doing, and I cannot advise it enough. The pro all the pros advise it. It allows you to make comparisons between yourself and the elite players. So you can do side-by-side -side comparisons, mechanical comparisons. What do they look like when they play? What do you look like? What do you sound like? What do they sound like? You can really deep dive into those and it will alleviate a lot of the problem areas that you think you're having just by doing that and making a note of the things you do. So record yourself, make a bunch of notes. Oh, I was too loud, too busy. 
um, snare needs to be a bit louder, um, blah, 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 blah. The groove needs to flow a bit more. You know, I can flow into the section by doing this. And then re-record yourself again. Compare the two. Then delete the, that, or like keep the top recording that you did at the start of the day and keep doing those comparisons all day. And then by the end of the day, you've got this, this video slash audio at the end that you can compare to you, you at the start of the day and you've made substantial improvement. That is how I've worked on my groove in depth. I plan on doing a video on how I've worked on my groove um, I have a very like specific method of doing it when, when it comes to recording and comparison against others, which has really helped me. Also, the mind has a wonderful way of turning what you've done earlier on in the day into something wonderful later on. Either wonderful or terrible, it goes either way. You either think it is the worst piece of shit you've ever played and you never want to think about it again, or you think it was the best thing you've ever played. And sometimes it's neither, sometimes it's very like middle of the road. Or sometimes it will be the worst piece of shit you've ever played. Sometimes it'll be the most amazing thing you've ever played. But at least it's factual. At least you have a record thing, a factual thing to be like to draw upon. And you can even send to your drum teachers or people you admire and ask them to also give you feedback on that too. You know, I avoided doing this for years because I was always afraid of what I was going to see on the other side of the camera. And I was always afraid of... But then like, you know, I don't even know what I was afraid of really because it was only me that was going to be looking, looking and analysing the video anyway. Um, and the more you do it, obviously the better you become and the more the more you pick up on things that you do. Um, and yeah, like send it to teachers, send it to people you admire and then, you know, if their analytical thing, if the same thing keeps cropping up all the time, like, oh, your technique on this, this exact technique doesn't quite feel right or look right, then you're like, okay, well, that's something I'll work on and then you just keep working on it. And if you're finding it, you know, that's where that's where other people will come in if you're finding it difficult to analyze your own, you know, critique your own thing like that, you know, album syndrome with musicians. When they listen to the same album that they've created so many times, they lose all sense of whether it's good or bad or they objectively cannot like analyze it anymore. So that's why it's handy to have a drum teacher or friends who play, um, you know, and if the same thing, like I said, if the same thing keeps cropping up, you know, that's something that you should work on. Okay, so learning to write, jumping back in, learning to write. So learning to write is a massive part of being able to learning to read. They go kind of hand in hand, I would say, and in this job and undoubtedly many, many, many gigs, they are gonna require you to write charts, chart edits. If you're doing live versions of charts, you're gonna to need to be able to write those in and edit them in real time um, at very often, very short notice periods. Um, you know, like I said, this helps with adding hits. Uh, you know, if you want to do a speci very specific drum fill that you love from a drummer, you can write that in yourself because you know how to write. You know, you can write it in yourself, and then you know, that kind of enhances the song. There's a drum fill in Crimea River by Justin Timberlake that I'm obsessed with by Brian Fraser Moore. So I hand wrote the whole the whole fill. When, so whenever we play that chart, I play that fill, and it fucking just sits and sounds so well because I charted th the whole thing. You know. Uh, there's there's kind of a there's kind of a really nice thing in being able to do that as well. On the last contract, we had a fly-on act actually, and it was very 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 last minute that we were asked to play with him. I think it was like a two-day turnaround or something, maybe a one-day turnaround. It was like, oh, you're playing tomorrow night, or you're doing a tech run tomorrow, daytime, and then tomorrow evening you'll play. And so the charts that we were given were absolutely shocking. Um, they were all. Um, they were all like scanned from a printer with horrendous handwritten notes over them. And so then they were scanned on and then the charts were digitally transferred to us. And so if I did not have the ability to write or get familiar, if I did not have the ability to write well or be able to doctor charts or be as familiar as I am with four score or force myself to be familiar with four score, I would have been fucked. So this is the chart that we were given in all its glory. As you can see, it is a piece of shit. It was horrible. I didn't know where I was supposed to be playing or where, or whatever. And because we had no fucking chart ref, no track references, we had to just kind of listen to what he had to say about it and then doctor it. So what I did is I, I recorded him, I, was, I recorded him singing it and playing it through so that it all made sense. And then I listened to it back and I, I doctored the chart. So this is what my chart ended up looking like.
as you can see, a shit ton more coherent. Let me just show you that difference again. So from that to this. So without my charting ability or being able to write, I would have been, I would have been absolutely fucked. And that has come up so many times. That's one example of a thousand that I've had to do in the last four years of working for this company. Because not every chart you're gonna get is gonna to be to your liking, to your satisfaction. If, if Tim Buell could write every one of my charts for the rest of my life, obviously I would do that. If I was a millionaire, I would pay him to do that for me. I would, much like Snoop Dogg has his own fucking joint roller that he pays like 50 grand a year, I think I would just pay Tim Buell to follow me around and chart anything I need. I need. Um, and so yeah, you won't always have the time. You could be asked to write a new chart over, you could be asked to write a whole new chart, like from scratch, because there is no chart. You could be asked to write a chart in an afternoon. You could be asked to write a chart over a few days. You could be asked to write a chart in 10 minutes. You could be asked just to, you know, sometimes you only have time just to map out the different sections and what the groove sounds like. Just write a quick variation of a groove and then what the, you know, there are many variations across the, of this across the board. And like I said, if this is a very, very big reality of what we do here, and I'm sure for the rest of our lives, being able to chart music and being able to write it in and learning to read and write is just, I cannot explain enough how much it's done for me. If writing is something you want to improve on or even just begin with, like I said at the start of the video, it is very important that you probably get a firm foundation in a teacher. Um, although YouTube and stuff is amazing, I would highly recommend that you go to a teacher because it's in person or, or online or whatever. At least you have a reference point to go to because sometimes with these videos, people will do a few videos that they think and then they lose interest and they won't do it. So then your development halts. Whereas if you're with a teacher, at least it's consistent and they can get you up to a certain level and then you just go to another teacher who's maybe at a higher level and then higher and higher and higher. That's what I did, my first teacher. You know, he was amazing. I loved him and he taught me to read from a very early age. But you know, you outgrow situations, you outgrow, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you want to, you know, I wanted to be surrounded by people who were doing the jobs I wanted. And so that's when, you know, working with Ben and working with Doug, they were doing these huge gigs. And so then you are one step closer because everything they're telling you is coming directly from them. So if I was you, practice charting out your favorite songs when you first begin to learn to write or your solos or favorite drum fills or anything like that. There is on Fourscore, you can create empty templates so you don't need to keep write, buying um, staff notation books anymore. There is endless amount of notations you can do on Fourscore. Uh, you can also learn to write in online programs and paid programs like Finale and things like that. But in essence, everything is the same. Um, a great course for learning to write or especially learning to write drum transcriptions in programs, which I need to do actually, is Tim Buell's transcription courses on YouTube and on his website that you that are free. Like he, he's the best guy ever. I was very lucky enough to interview Tim on my podcast, Music's Elite Seat. Uh, not so long ago and he's just the world's nicest guy but also just like so dedicated to his craft and he gives away so much free stuff to the music community and drum community at large. I'm so grateful. Tim, if you ever get around to watching this video, I'm so grateful for you. Um, but obviously generally the more you read, the more you understand. The more you understand, the more you can write. The more you can write, the more you can read. The, it literally, it's like a positive spin cycle of fucking goodness within you know your musical development. You know, the more development of understanding you have with the notes means you can play them more. The, you know, you'll be able to make connections between your favorite players. You'll be able to, you know, make those associations. You'll be able to go and take an idea that they've done and run, really run with it. You know, it's, it's crazy how many times this has happened and how far my development has come just from that. So uh, the next section is auditions. So I have spoken in depth about auditions on my page, uh, auditions about cruise ships in specifics. Um, I've never auditioned for big time pop artists or acts or anything like that. But when I do, I will be sure to also do vlogs on those. So I've spoken in depth about auditions, how to audition, where to find auditions, what to expect at auditions. Uh, they're on my page and I will also link those in the bio as well. I've done two one hour long one and one 20 minute one 
basically skimming over the pre-audition, at audition and post-audition um, and things like that. But in relation to this video, the nightmare reading scenario that I gave you at the start where you get your sheet music for the first time and you're asked to play it down, that has actually happened to me multiple times like I explained. They test your on-the-spot reading skills, but sometimes, sometimes you will get charts beforehand or you will get time in the room with the chart, so 10, 10, 15 minutes before, long enough to get a comprehension of the chart. So here's what I do, a very quick breeze through of this because I've talked about it so in depth already, but a very quick breeze through of before the audition or, or the different scenarios of auditions with the in regards to reading. So if you're allowed to prepare the song before the audition, look up the original for the authenticity, look up live versions to add extra like nuances in, Get as much off book as you can, which means you're not reading the chart at all. Even if you have the chart there, it's just a crutch as a refer quick reference if you want to check something. In because this will allow you to engage more in the room with the panel of judges or your other musicians or whatever. It'll allow you to really free up, you know, your time and you can like, you know, add little cool bits in if you want to and really smile and engage with people. This will also allow you to like learn to fill into the hits, fill around the hits, fill into stops, all that cool stuff which really adds to the feel of the music and really lean, make sure you're really leaning into the dynamics as well, which we've already spoken about. That's if you have time, if they send you charts like weeks before your audition, which is the ideal scenario for anyone. If you're in the room and you're allowed five to 10 minutes with the chart, this is what I would do. Mark everything on the chart you can, like we've already spoken about. Mark everything that you think is going to throw you off. Have a very quick read through. Make sure they'll only ever ask you, I think, to play two or three tracks. Have a very quick read through. Mark the section changes. Mark the dynamic changes. And mark, mark grooves and simplify any grooves you think are going to trip you up. That is my advice if you're in the room. If you're reading it down for the first time, obviously. The scenario we none of us like or enjoy, if you're reading it down for the first time and you're still a bit iffy with your reading skills, try your best to read ahead as much as you can and try and catch anything, any stabs or anything like that, and any stops. Those would be the main things that I would say you need to look out for, or any you know changes within the music. Simplify the groove if needs be. Like I said, no one's gonna kick your ass if you just get through the chart unscathed, you've started at the right time, stopped at the right time, any hits you've added in the middle. And if the ending is super complicated, just try and get through it as best you can. But again, simplify it if you really need to. And as long as you're ending when you should, at least that'll show you have a good enough ability level to read where you should be stopping and starting. But like I said, everything else you wanna know about auditions for cruise ships, I go in massive depth about them, about the different types I've encountered, you know, group auditions, uh, auditions just with a panel, track and click auditions, reading, all that stuff I go into in depth in the videos that I will link in the uh, bio below. The last thing I'm going to touch upon is reading and practicing rhythm. This is very difficult uh, when you first start, like recognizing those patterns. So this is something I've only recently become aware of, the tools that other musicians are using to work on their timing and rhythm work. So the first and I would say the best app is called RhythmBot. It is by JP Bouvet. I don't know if he developed it. I don't know who actually developed it, but basically it, it allows you to it just, it's like a reading, it's a reading tool. So it'll, it'll give you like random rhythm combinations in time that you have to play to. So it might be like an eighth. It might be like click, 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 click. So you're reading along whilst the click is going and you're learning to read those different rhythms. And so he goes way more in depth about it on his website and on his YouTube page. And apparently, and so this is gonna aid anyone going into reading auditions uh, if you really wanna get your rhythm reading up. Like say if they have like, you need to read this section or you need to read you know these hits with a jazz thing. Um, go to his Instagram or his website, JP Bouvet, so it's B-O-U-V-E-T. He's, he's amazing as well, I absolutely love that guy. Um, and so he, yeah, he's developed that. And then there's another, there, there are other apps out there. So just search rhythm app or whatever, um, which will give you, um, it has been covered comprehensively throughout YouTube and things like that. Even if you type in rhythm training on YouTube or rhythm training in your app store, I'm sure there will be thousands of apps that will come up that will help you reading. Benny Greb probably has one by now. It will really help you with reading rhythms on the spot. 
So, on to my final thoughts. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed everything that I've said and all the advice that I've given. It is all time tested. But these are my final thoughts on reading. Basically, you do not want to let your learning to read or learning to write at whatever stage of your musical path you are on become something you were never good at or never had time for, too old for, or my personal favorite, never had the attention span to sit down and do because I also felt like that. And obviously I'm much further along in my, in my reading ability now because of the things that I did. Because although some jobs are not reading gigs and, and they don't require you to be the, the, an incredible reader, like I said at the start, a lot are, but also why would you not want to give yourself the most opportunities and the highest advantage you possibly can by being able to read and learn to write and read really well? Why would you not want to give yourself that opportunity? Surely you would rather being able to learn to read and write really well and to a very good standard and not use it on gigs than you would if you couldn't read and write and not be, and you know what I mean? It's that thing of like, well, you'd rather bring a coat in case it rains than be, you know, not have a coat if it rains. You know, that is kind of that, that old saying. I find those excuses kind of incredibly weak, to be honest, that, oh, I never had the attention span, oh, I was never good in school, oh, I just don't have the time, you know, because, we have time. You have time to do everything. You have to create a big enough why in your life to do it. If you have a big enough why, if you have an audition next week, I guarantee you, you'll be sitting at that dinner table trying, you know, really trying to hone in on your reading. Or if you go to an audition and you fuck it up and you've embarrassed yourself in front of a room full of musicians like I did, that will fucking spur you on, you know? Or if you fail at an audition which could have meant a better life for you because you were a weak reader, you know, your why will be big enough. And so why would you not want to expand your drumming knowledge in, in that terms? You know, it is gonna, it is gonna take years and it, it's gonna take months and years. And even I'm not at the level that I wanna be at yet. I, I still read it every single night. Every night I read before bed and I read and I wanna get my hands on as many charts and I still watch drum videos and clinics and everything. You know, it takes years. You know, I won't be fluent in Welsh for years and I, I, you accept that, but you delay that gratification because you know at the end, you are in for a much, much better level of musicianship and life and easier time of things. You know, if, if, if someone turns around to you and says, we have, a, we have a really, really good paying wedding gig on Sunday and it's Friday, um, but we don't have any charts. This is, this is not a sight reading gig. You know, we just need you to come prepared. And there's all these complicated live arrangements. Surely you would want to be able to read and write because then, although you'll be up two nights and you'll probably lose a lot of sleep, being able to learn and write, you can just read and write a bunch of your own charts, everything's perfect. You go on the gig, you're reading it down, everything's going perfect. I guarantee you, you will get more work from that. Like a really easy analogy that I like to think about, Americans learn to drive on automatic cars only, whereas in the U which means they can only ever drive automatic cars. In the UK, we learn to drive in a manual car, which means we can drive a manual car or an automatic car. That means we can drive either. It gives us the option of both. It's exactly the same with this. You want to be able to learn to read and write because even if you do gigs that do not require you to read, you still have that ability level. But then when you want to do gigs that do require you to read and write, you also can do that. Like reading is not something you like qualify and you get a qualification and then you're a fucking, oh, I'm a level grade eight reader, blah, blah, blah. You know, although grades, grading and all that nonsense, I think, you know, it's a money-making scheme personally. Um, I never did any grades and I did absolutely fine. Um, but, you know, I can also see the benefits. Yeah, I just, like, it's not for me personally. I can see the benefit, you know, it does get you to read and write at a much earlier age and, you know, there's certificates, but it's like, you know, I don't really, yeah, not for me. But it's, it's like a lifelong journey. Reading and writing is a lifelong journey, just like, reading books or anything like that. There's so, there's always more vocabulary to discover. There's always some new drummer coming out with some new cool things, with a new cool drum book that you want to get on board with. Different styles, different time signatures, you know, more elite levels of playing to study. This is a never ending journey. Like I said, I'm at a, I'm at a very decent reading level now because of the jobs that I've had and the exposure and all of the steps that I've spoken to you about today. But I still, I still read charts all the time. I still, watch and play along with accompanying stuff and any new gig I get I am always safe in the knowledge that I can read that is the biggest comfort to me to know that no matter what 
no matter how much sleep I'll lose, I can chart out anything I need to in relatively short amounts of time. The next thing I'd love to do is be able to chart them properly on, uh, I'm gonna watch a bunch of Tim Buell stuff on being able to transcribe in Finale in order to get the actual PDF charts to then transfer myself rather than handwriting all my charts on my iPad, which always takes longer. But that, so that's, the, that's where I'm taking personally my reading journey next and writing journey next, but I still do it every day. It is a never ending thing. Now I do it more so out of pure habit and joy because I now see reading charts, like clinic charts, like Vic Firth Jams and Zildjian Live, I see that as like a fucking a vacation from reading the stuff I have to read every night with the ships, you know? It's like, ironically, that that's become fun for me to read those things and watch along and follow along and take the ideas out and see how far I can stretch them. You know, how far can I stretch a sextuplet? Maybe I do linear sextuplet diddles, you know, all that shit. And all that stuff adds, everything adds up, everything compounds. You know, with inspiration, every note on the drum kit, every note of guitar, every note of keys has already been played. Everything has been played. Music has been around for a very long time. Everything's been played. So why would you not want to be able to learn to read and really delve into the, you know, the bare bones of what that idea was and kind of twist it and manipulate it and make it your own? It, that's, it's really important for your inspiration and to get ideas from other other sources, not just from the new YouTube lick all the time or the new fancy lick. You know, I you know I absolutely love Aaron Spears as well. You know, but everything that he does most of the time is taken out of context, and everyone's like, oh, they just take the lick from an Ariana Grande song that he did, which was unbelievable. They take that and then they're like, we'll teach you this, and then they teach it to you, and then you try and put that in every song that doesn't fit that style. You know, whereas if you learn to read and you learn to write, you have context for what you're doing, you know? Obviously what cannot go understated is the amount of time that goes into this, but also then that has to transpire with time behind the kit. It is time you need to spend reading and playing and being frustrated and learning new unfamiliar things and, you know, spending that time because that's where the growth happens, you know. So what cannot be understated is also time behind your drum kit and at your instrument with the chart that you have done. And it's essential to follow your passions. That's where I got where I am. I followed my passions. I downloaded charts. So one last analogy, I promise, and I will stop with the shit crap analogies. Would you rather learn all of your vocabulary from TV and film where you can only replicate the phrases and the catchphrases that they say on TV or would you rather learn to write and read and construct from the basics of and foundations of language itself and construct anything you would like that is the way I feel about reading and writing music which in turn gives you unlimited resources unlimited resources and once you do once you begin to grasp it will be the most maddening in infuriating, creative, wonderful, enlightening experience within music, I promise. Doors will start to open that you have never conceived before. Like I mentioned before, Fourscore is fast becoming a industry standard that you need to be familiar with for cruise ships, pantomime, theater, anything like that. It is becoming an industry standard, so I strongly suggest you get to grips with it and that you download it and get familiar with it, please watch my tutorial just because I really went into the program itself and highlighted everything I thought was important, step by step, chapter by chapter. Even if there's something that you, you're you like, oh, I just wanna know how to do a new pen. I've even done the chapter that's like pens. So you just click on that and it'll skip to that section so you're not wasting any of your time. But that is something that is now becoming a very, very, very important in the music scene. So I strongly advise that you do that. So one last shout out to Tim again. He's incredibly gracious and kind with his resources. You know, there are so many things that he could be charging for that he doesn't, like the Vic Firth Jams master file. You know, you have 20 drummers on there that he has meticulously spent time transcribing. He has courses on transcribing on his website and on his YouTube page. He has hundreds of free charts on his website. And I would encourage you, and this just goes across the board for any um, grassroots, uh, you know, local things within. We need to support the, the people. We need to support each other in music and things like that. So buy directly from the websites, buy from Benny Greb's store, buy from Tim Buell's shop, you know, 
spend your money. You know, Aaron Sterling has a wonderful series on, you know, on drum production and, and you know, production within computers and like, you know, spend your money on that and spend your money supporting, you know, I think I might do another video on it at another time, but supporting your local artists, they need it way more than than a lot of other corporations do, you know? Like you are directly supporting that artist and I promise you they really, really do appreciate it and it does make the world a difference for them. And so with even with, you know, with Tim, buy his packages, buy, you know, the stuff that he has put together and spent thousands of hours trying to amass, you know, the Aaron Spears, you know, uh, the Aaron Spears master file, the Aaron Sterling master file, all those things are just so fantastic. Buy the loops, buy things, you know, from the direct source. People, it makes a world of difference and it will only encourage more people to create more things from the grassroots level rather than constantly buying things from the corporations or the massive drum companies which do not promise you, do not need it as much as the guys surrounding us. So to end, at last, I'm sorry I've whittled on, like I say to anyone wanting to improve anything or wanting to get work on ships or in theatre or anything like that, you know, I'm still on my own journey myself. I have drumming goals. I want to play for Adele. I want to, you know, do massive touring shows with pop acts. I would love to play the London Palladium pantomime every year. I'd love to play, you know, Royal Albert Hall and World Tours and Glastonbury and all of those things. So I'm still very much on my own journey. But even as far as I've got now, you know, inaugural cruising was, was like my number one priority when I first started with a company. Like I say to anyone, just decide what you want to do and go the fuck after it. Set the intention, work towards it every day, work towards it, manifest it, put it into the universe, tell everyone you know about it. Practice, time and patience and I promise you, you can get whatever fucking gig you want. You can get to an insane level of reading, you can teach at the highest schools, all of those things. You know, the more you do it, the easier it becomes, I promise. When I when I first started cruising, I didn't have a fucking clue what I was doing. When I Before I started cruising, I, there was no information like this out there online about auditioning for ships, where to find auditions, how to get drum charts, where to read, how to read well. You know, so that's why I'm trying to do it now. I'm doing it to just try and help. Help give out information I wish I had when I was coming up through the ranks. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be painful, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be a long journey, but just delay that gratification because it's worth it. Ironically, we're not up against as many people as we think in these jobs. That's something I've been thinking a lot about recently. You know, all these pop tours use the same guys. Devin Styx Taylor, who's one of my favorite drummers at the moment, plays for Justin Bieber, Mary J. Blige, Nicki Minaj. You know, he plays for all these fucking mega stars and he's one guy, you know, because he's one of the best in the world at it. And he just dedicated the time and patience it took to get there. And it's the same at every level. Ironically, because you see thousands of musicians out there online and on YouTube and on, on the web and stuff, yeah, anyone can sit in their bedroom and play and, and, and post videos online, but not everyone has the time and patience and resilience to see it through and to come out and do these jobs. So I promise you're not up against as many people as you think. Be a good human being, first and foremost what the world needs less of is fucking assholes and you know people who just drain on you or on society you know so be a good person be helpful be kind give things back you know if people if you get to a good level of reading and you are mass charts and someone asks you for charts don't be selfish you know give them out because it will only ever get returned tenfold like my mum always says thank you for watching i hope it's been helpful and i'll see you in the next ones